disagreed to, and I call the member for Macquarie. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'm so pleased to be supporting the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Amendment Bill. I was delighted when the previous government introduced legislation to at least get offshore wind starting, although there were many gaps in that legislation that this bill uh, seeks to uh, correct and to ensure that the essential things are in place for offshore wind projects to be able to start. And I think it's really important to understand why offshore wind is so important. It is part of a suite of renewable energy initiatives and the energy initiatives that we have, which are about cleaner, cheaper and more secure energy. And our budget last night uh, outlined our spending on so many of those, which really gives people a sense of hope that we are moving into this renewable energy growth that we know has just been waiting for a decade to be unleashed. Uh, for my own electorate, it means really practical things like community batteries for East Blacksland and Hobartville, which will help them significantly reduce their power costs. Uh, but also energy efficiency grants for small and medium business. So they're some of the really practical things. But this legislation is about something that people say they want governments to do, and that is think longer term and put things in place that will see us into the future. And that's exactly what this legislation does. Um, I, I sometimes have to say to people, why am I so excited about wind, offshore wind? And I, I want to explain that. There is enough wind potential just off Australia's coasts to power our electricity grid several times over. If all the current proposed uh, wind farms were built, their combined energy capacity would be greater than all of Australia's coal-fired power stations combined. Do you know, um, one of the other key comparisons I think we find is with the United Kingdom. The UK is an absolute world leader in offshore wind. Uh, they were, got onto it long, long before for the previous government even realised it existed, I think. They've got more installed capacity than any other country. And already offshore wind, their power is the equivalent of 4.5 million homes annually generating for them about 10% of their electricity. But at that scale, it's much more impactful for us. And the cost of new offshore wind has fallen there by 50% since 2015. And it is now one of the lowest cost options for new power in the UK. It's cheaper than new gas and cheaper than nuclear power. So this is the, the opportunity that we have, that we are finally seizing in being able to have a proper set of legislation that allows for these offshore wind projects to progress. Uh, I mean, interestingly, only last year, we didn't even have a process to allow for these, these uh, projects to be built. And I know for years, investors, energy experts, uh, people I've worked with in, in my life prior to politics were waiting and desperate to see a regulatory framework for the offshore wind industry. And, and that's why the progress we've made in the last 12 months, um, you know, after much urging for many years by us, has been really heartening. Um, the, we do have, look, we do have catching up to do, and that's what this legislation will help put in place. Um, the, since we came to government, we've taken a few steps in this wind, offshore wind area. And one of those is to outline proposals for the first six offshore wind projects. And that includes 200, a 200 turbine wind farm off the Gippsland coast, uh, which will generate jobs as well as electricity. So that is, that's the bonus that we have. And it really helps shore up our national uh, energy security uh, grid. Just, here's what I want you to think about. Just one rotation of one offshore wind turbine provides as much energy as an average rooftop solar installation generates in a day. Think about that. One turbine, one rotation does what an entire rooftop solar installation does in a day. And that's the scale of it. That's why we have the capacity to be an energy superpower and exporting 
exporting the ex excess energy that we create. Um, uh, anyone who has seen the, uh, the energy minister uh, speak about this will see his passion. And I know my community in the Blue Mountains who got to meet with him in person in the lead up to the election mm. saw his absolute commitment to this. Yeah. Uh, and I think what we're demonstrating in these first few months is the pace at which it needs to happen, because sadly, nothing has been happening in this space in, with any sense of urgency or pace uh, for, for the decade. Uh, of all the proposals, there's the Gippsland one on the coast in Victoria. Uh, there's, there's also the Hunter and Illawarra coast in New South Wales, much more close to home for, for me. And I, I think we all recognise that there's a need to really develop these industries in renewables in places where they will be transitioning from the old traditional sources to these newer ones, and I, I really welcome those. All of the sites, including the one in Western Australia and, and off Tassie and off Perth and Bunbury, have all been chosen because of the good to excellent wind resources, plus their existing energy generation facilities and their connections to the transmission networks, as well as their locations near ports or industrial hubs. So it's really sensible thinking about where the most practical places are to put it. And this legislation that we're talking about will, will allow those projects to take the next steps. Um, one of the things that I, I think is really important in the work that we're doing around the offshore uh, wind power is to think about the way the community gets consulted around it. It will have impacts. And even though these are uh, about five, starting at about 5.5 kilometres offshore, we have to be very mindful of the other environmental and human impacts that they will have, impacts on uh, people, other people using those waters. So our, our approach will always be to have genuine open consultation. And certainly as someone who's been part of a, a so-called consultation over a new airport in Western Sydney, I have been highly critical of the processes the previous government allowed to happen there, where the consultation was not genuine. It was tick and flick stuff. And I, as, a, as a community member, I will be calling for every, at every stage, open consultation. And I know that's what anybody connected to these projects has a right to expect as well. Um, I think the, the other part of all of this, Deputy Speaker, is how it fits into the big picture. And now these projects are really exciting, but I can imagine people saying, well, yeah, they're going to take a long time. What's in it for me? How does this actually affect my life as someone who's looking at my power bill and going, oh my goodness, the cost of power has gone up. How, how am I going to cope with that? We are really aware of the increased costs of power. I think it's very disappointing that the previous government hid those likely cost rises from people using regulation to hide and keep information from people in the lead up to the election. Uh, the news might not be things that people want to hear, but it's really important that we tell it like it is. And then we work through the pathway to resolve and find some relief. Uh, and we do this with a view not just for short-term sugar hits, but to get the systems in place in the long term so that we ultimately end up with cleaner, cheaper and more secure energy uh, for many, many years to come. So doing this offshore wind is really key in that whole process. I mean, we're doing it because it gets us fabulous huge amounts of renewable energy, and that's great for the environment, but it is absolutely vital in bringing additional supply into our electricity market. And we know, we all know that that is a key to getting lower prices. We won't hide from the fact that energy hikes are hurting people. And, and we'll be upfront about the reasons why, as the Business Council of Australia says, it's the impact of the Ukrainian war, so global forces, but also, as they describe it, 15 years of domestic energy policy chaos. Now, that chaos has ended. This government has already demonstrated that that chaos has ended yeah. and that we are putting forward sensible, deliverable and pragmatic 
uh, energy plans and, really importantly, working with the states because a lot of the rollout of this happens at a state level. As the Prime Minister and Treasurer have both said uh, in the last 24 hours, we will work through this, these latest forecasts and expectations of what the prices will be doing around the energy market. We'll be looking at regulatory and other steps that we can take. And I certainly know how much pain is likely to be felt in the, in the homes of people in the Hawkesbury and Blue Mountains in my electorate when they open those bills. And I say to my community, I would really like to hear the circumstances that you're facing so that we are able to understand the different impacts it's having across a wide range of different, different families and their different situations. That's the only way that we're going to be able to <clears throat> work through and, and come up with a pathway to provide support to families to get through this time. In the medium and longer term, we know there are many steps that are being put in place, like the community patries, like the solar banks, like offshore wind and, and increases in that renewable energy. But we know that there's going to be pain felt between now and then. And I want to share your stories so that we can make sure we put everything in place possible to support people.